Good morning, everyone. Our call to worship today is from Psalm 29, King James Version. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory that's due unto his name. And worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So come and join us as we sing. Thank you. 
It can be a confusing world. So we come together on Sunday mornings to, to remember that, that Jesus Christ, God's Son, Jesus the King, was crucified, buried, and then raised to life again on our behalf. And to renew our trust in Him as the foundation of our lives. To remember that He and His commandments, His commandment to love, are the key to bringing focus and meaning, purpose and joy and love into our lives. So let's continue in worship, but let's take a few moments to just be quiet as we respond to His invitation to us to give ourselves to him because of course he gave himself for us let's remind ourselves in these quiet moments that we are his and he is ours and that there's no greater or safer place to be than surrender to his love and surrender to his will because he is faithful thank you lord
trust in him you saints forever he is faithful changing never neither life nor death can sever those he loves from him those he loves from him keep us lord
celebrate you, Lord Jesus. Indeed, you are worthy of it, more than worthy of it. Words can hardly tell, but we do celebrate you, and we, we rejoice that you are risen. You live forevermore. You're coming for us. You're bringing your kingdom. You've brought your kingdom, and you're bringing it in all its fullness. We look forward to that day. And we ask for your spirit's continued presence in our midst. Bless Pastor Ian as he shares your word with us today. And bless our hearts to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. So I just have to find where I am here. There I am. So I, I just wanted to ask us if we know what last Wednesday was. I mean, most people know that last Wednesday was Valentine's Day, right? But this year, Wednesday was the start of Lent in the Catholic Church, and I think other churches observe Lent. And I just wanted to share a little bit about what Lent is about. So first of all, I want to ask if anybody knows what is required of somebody during Lent. Uh, that's close, but not quite. You're, the 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 idea of Lent for a, a believer is that you sacrifice something that's important in your life that you actually could do without. For a lot of people, when I was young, that meant giving up candy for 40 days. And then when I was a teenager, we gave up a favorite TV show every night. And it wasn't, wasn't allowed to be the news. It had to be something you really <laughs> wanted to watch, right? And, and also... When we got older, one year Colleen and I gave up uh, meat for 40 days. That was a challenge. Uh, but it's supposed to be something that you sacrifice that betters your, your character or gives you a better understanding of things. And that's usually where most people leave Lent. But Lent has another uh, side to it that um, is, is focuses. First of all, it's 40 days, and 40 days is basically a tithe of a year so it's supposed to be a, a time of personal sacrifice in introversion more prayer and preparing to um, really appreciate what Jesus did for us on the cross and the other thing that Lent focuses on is alms now does anybody know what alms are alms are giving to the poor right but the, so there's ways you can give to the poor, like you can give to a food bank, you can uh, give of your time, an alms of your time to help somebody that's struggling or to tutor somebody or do those things or, you know, give money. But mostly alms focuses on your community, the needs in, in your immediate community or shortly around it's not giving to uh, um, you know far away uh, charities and stuff and so the question is is uh, is that part of Lent is it uh, is it scriptural or is it just something that the church made up to make you suffer a little more for 40 days than you normally would so if I go to Proverbs Proverbs 19 Verse 17 says, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. So when God says he's going to repay you for doing good, that doesn't mean he's going to punish you. He's not going to get even with you. He means he's going to bless your life. If you're doing what's in the will of God, you will be blessed. And it says farther on in Proverbs 19 and verse 21, it says, many are the plans of the mind of a man but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. And so when we purpose in our hearts or in our minds to, to do things in the name of the Lord, we, we ought to make sure that what we're doing is what he wants us to be doing. And so um, that requires that we pray and we be in commune with, with God about everything we do, but especially as I'm talking about tithes and offerings, I'm talking about make sure what we're doing is in 
in his eyes what we should be doing. And so when we look around our community, there's all kinds of places we can uh, put our time and our efforts, but we need to be praying about where God would have us be in the community and what he'd have us doing. And so I just encourage us to, for this 40 days, not from not, it's not 40 days anymore, but from here till Easter, just be more focused on the community, look for needs, try to fill those needs, and um, focus on your spiritual walk with God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, what you've done for us. Thank you for all that you give us. And Lord, as we um, are so blessed, we just ask that you'd show us how you'd have us return some of that uh, blessing to others and that we would be good stewards of what you give us and support other people. Ask us in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I've been reminding the ladies over the last month about coming out for our meetings, which we had been calling an idea for women. And I'm happy to say that an idea for women has given birth to In Her Shoes, which is our new peer support group for women who've suffered trauma. And uh, we're launching our first official meeting coming up this week on Wednesday. Um, so for those of you, there we are. For those of you who don't, uh, haven't been out to a meeting, don't know, or for you men who will not be invited, sorry. Um, <laughs> I want to read you our mission statement just so you can know what it is that we are going to be doing. So we are a gathering of local women who wish to provide a safe, caring space for all women to be heard, encouraged, and supported. We want to love as Christ loved. Whether others share our belief or not, we're here to listen, provide connection and community through which we can lift each other up. So these meetings are going to be monthly, and they're open to all women age 16 and up. And um, for those of you who won't be coming, including you men, um, you can pray for us. Um, pray that the women who need to come will come, and that we will reach them not only with the support they need, but that they'll be interested in uh, hearing more about Jesus. This is for all women. So we're going to have, we're opening this up to the community which is why you can also pray for our safety as we open up to the larger community and just pray that this will, will really be led by and guided by the Lord and, and that we will do what we hope he will have us do. Um, so that is Wednesday, February 21st, 6 p.m. We'll have coffee and then a meeting. And uh, for all of you who are here, you're invited. And if you know someone who should be there, would like to be there, bring her along. So hope to see you then. And um, we, we're talking, particularly, we began this after Christmas, uh, and we're going to show that Jesus was around before the manger. And so the question is, what was Jesus doing before that time? And before I carry on, I just want to recognize Dwayne and his family. It's so good to have you back here with us. You've been traveling the world. Uh, in a Sunday or two later on, I'd like to give you some time and let us let you share some of the ministry you were doing on the other side of the planet. So uh, appreciate uh, what you're doing for the Lord, Dwayne. You uh, you got a heart for the Lord and carry on that heart. And that's uh, God has given us a heart. He's given us passion for different ministries and different areas of things you have for us to do. There's a universal call for all of us, which is to come to Jesus in faith. And then that's the corporate uh, call, and Jesus has called us individually to do particular things in this life and in this world. And so uh, he's called his church. He's called his uh, people to himself. And as we look through the scripture today, we're, we're looking at things that certain people did in this case, in the Old Testament, because what we're talking today is about Jesus of the Old Testament. We don't normally think of Jesus as being an Old Testament character. We don't always think of Jesus as being there in the beginning, and he was. And when was the beginning? Before everything else. 
You and I can't comprehend the beginning any more than we can comprehend the end of space. And so when we start imagining the beginning, when was that? If we carry on with that very long, we'll go bonkers because nobody can wrap their head around the beginning. We know it was a long time ago, but it was before time, before anything else. God was in the beginning, according to Genesis 1.1. And then in John 1, we talked about this the other week, that in the beginning was the Word, in the beginning was Jesus, according to the Apostle John, and he was the Word, he is the Word, he is the beginning before all things were. So Jesus was there at creation. When it says God created the heavens and the earth, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, he's talking about the triune God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. They were all creators. And so Jesus, of course, was in the Old Testament as well as the New He was here since the beginning of time. He created you. He designed you. And it is he that came to earth that we may see the face of God because we couldn't see him before. Not like this. The entire Bible is God's history book on the Old and the New Testament. Right from the very beginning, the Old Testament has the true story of God and his son, Jesus, who came in the wooden manger. If it was wooden of all, it may have been stone. We think of it as wooden. We're pretty sure the cross was was wood. So I often say the wooden manger to the wooden cross, but before that he came for you. And beloved, you must never, ever, ever forget that Jesus came for you of his great love. The Old Testament is a collection of amazing stories, actually primarily, about Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament leads to him, to Jesus as our Savior. And since the purpose of that story is to point us to Jesus, and those stories will cause us to look forward to the promised Christ that is coming back one day for the faithful. Coming back one day for the followers of Jesus. And Jesus has called us all When he started his ministry on this earth, he called 12 people. 12 men that left their lives behind and they followed Jesus. Since then, he's called us all. Not just the 12, he's called us all. But if we don't kind of set our life aside and decide to follow him, we're not in him. We have to to follow him in order to be in him. We have to follow him in order to be ready to receive him when he comes back to get us, to receive us to himself. We have to believe in him and have faith in him and to obey him before we get the benefits of the forgiveness of sin, which has to happen in order us us to have a relationship with God. He came to come and forgive you and me. We talked the other week about all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Every single person on the planet that has ever lived or died, starting with Adam, needs forgiveness. We all need forgiveness. We need to recognize that. And Jesus is the only way for us to have our sins forgiven. Come to him. Receive him as our personal savior. Ask him to be a part of our life. Repent of our sins, scripture says. So who is 
this Jesus. Who is the Jesus of the Old Testament? Starts out early. That creation starts out in Genesis 1. In Genesis chapter 22, we have the story of Abraham. God called Abraham to himself and started a nation. The nation would be provided so that Jesus could be born in a nation, the nation of Israel. Abraham was the first Israelite. God called him. Abraham, as far as you know, was a pagan. He didn't know Jehovah God until God spoke to him. And the scripture says, and as Abraham believed God, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Believing God, and that means that everything about him will make us righteous. And in uh, chapter 22 of Genesis, we have this story. I'll read a couple of verses. Now it came about that after these things that God tested Abraham. Never been tested? And he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And then God says, take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. That is a weird story. Do you think too hard about it? It makes me go kind of, Really, I can't get my, my head wrapped around what God asked Abraham to do, but it was a test. Take the only son that you love and give him, sacrifice him to me. And Isaac was a willing participant. He went along with his dad. And then Isaac inquires, hey, dad, we have the wood, we have the fire on the donkey. You had to have a little bit of fire. You didn't strike a match in those days. You had to carry that along with you. A three days journey with a donkey and a few other, a couple other young men came with him as servants. And then God said, you keep going and I will show you the place where I want this to happen. God is a place guy, the place that things happen is really important to God. I don't know why, but it is. There was a special place that God wanted the sacrifice to take place, Mount Moriah. Where in the world was Mount Moriah? Well, interestingly enough, when God shows Abraham the place of the sacrifice, a thousand years later, Solomon would build the great temple on the Mount of Moriah. Isn't that interesting? And that is the very place that Jesus was crucified. The place mattered to God. And so God revealed to Abraham the place. But before Abraham had to slay his son, his son said, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will supply the sacrifice. And there in the bushes was a young yearling ram, which Abraham went, took, and offered that to God as a sacrifice. Doesn't that sound a bit like John 3.16? What happened in that verse? God says, take your son, your only son, the one that you love, and sacrifice. And Psalm 316, for God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his one and only son, that whosoever believeth on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Similar. And then we go. That's representing something. That's foreshadowing something. I want to go to Joshua. Chapter 5 and verse 13. Just quickly a couple of verses here. I'm wanting to show now that Jesus showed up. He showed up, you might say, with Abraham and Isaac because it says the Lord in a voice said to Abraham, do not slay your son. It provides a sacrifice. The Lord said, 
Sometimes it talks about an angels. Sometimes those the angels in the Old Testament, I believe, is Jesus himself speaking. It may have been Jesus himself that spoke to Abraham through an angel or however he did that and said what he said. Here is the sacrifice, and it's foreshadowing what was going to happen many, many generations later. Verse 13 of chapter 5 of Joshua says, Now it came about when Joshua was, was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, This is weird. Think about this. Joshua sees this man coming to him. They've already got into Canaan. They've crossed the Jordan River, and they're trying to get rid of their adversaries. He says, are you for us or for are you are you for our adversaries? And the angel responds and he said, No, rather I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said, said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals. Off your feet for the place you were standing is holy ground. And Joshua did that. I guess so. What happened when God encountered Moses in the wilderness? He talked to him through a bush. And the Lord spoke to him. Got his attention. And what did he say to Moses? He said, take your shoes off. Take your sandals off. For the ground you stand on is holy ground. That's the same thing he said to Joshua. Joshua bowed down. There's no one else you bow down to except the Lord of hosts. It wasn't just an angel that came and talked to Joshua. It was the Lord himself that came and talked to Joshua. Jesus showed up in the Old Testament. And he gave Joshua the instructions. We're going to go over to Daniel in in chapter 3. I'm just going to these Old Testament stories to show us who showed up in the story. Nebuchadnezzar. Kind of a mean-spirited guy. You didn't really want to be on the wrong side of Nebuchadnezzar. You would like to be his friend and not his foe. But there's these three guys, Nebuchadnezzar, you remember he had the, people were supposed to bow down to the graven image, you know the story? And there were three men that would not bow down, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king uh, stood up in haste and he said to his high officials, see what happens is as, as the, the commandment was to bow down to the graven image of the king. And whoever did not bow down would be cast in to the burning, fiery furnace. And three men would not bow down to the graven image. And so they, they cast them in to the, into the furnace. And remember, the king was angry. He was so angry He made the furnace seven times hotter than it normally was. And I've thought of this before, and I've said this before. I don't know how you had the gauge that said, now it's seven times hotter. This little gauge says normal. And then as the the servants put more and more wood or whatever they had to burn, make it hotter, and all of a sudden, seven times hotter. Now we throw the guys in because he's so mad. So we got three Israelites in the furnace. And that was the first time they had those see-through fireplaces. <laughs> you know, the, the new, all the nice new, new fires, it was stoves, they're all like glass doors. So that's so you see the fire. So I, that's when it almost must have come from there. 
So Nebuchadnezzar had one of those see-through fireplaces, and he was watching these guys, and he liked to watch people get burned to death. He got a kick out of that. And so there was just a problem with these guys. And so Nebuchadnezzar inquires to his officials. By the way, the officials that, that threw them in, they all died. They got burnt. But he didn't care. It didn't matter to him. So Nebuchadnezzar inquires. He says, was it not three men that we cast into the, into the midst of the fire? And they replied to the king, certainly, O king, it was three. And he said, well, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth man is like a son of the gods. He didn't know Jehovah God. But he knew something was up, and it looked like he was the son of the Most High God. How would he know what the Son of God looked like? But he had an intuition. He had an idea. He had a revelation. Jesus was there. Jesus showed up in the burning, fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it was seen by Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar turned from his wickedness. And then I, I want to go to, to, to Job. I just, I just love this. And there's more, and I'll, I'll probably just end with this one. Job is an extraordinary human being. He was righteous in the sight of God, and yet all these calamities came upon him. You can't help but be, feel sorry for Job. I, when I was young, I had two little border collie. One little border collie I got when I was young, and I named it Job. It was a female, so I called it Joby. She died at three months. Had a had a aneurysm or something. Just went died right in front of me in a fit. And I thought, well, I'll get another dog. I'll call that one Joby. That one died. I said, I'm quitting calling my dogs Joby. I'm out, no more Job's on this place. Poor Job, he, everything was thrown at him by the devil. I don't know why God let that, but it happened, and we're not going to question God. And here's what Job says. After all these things happened, and it's a long, we, we don't exactly know the date of Job, but it was a long, long, long time before Jesus, probably before the rest of the prophets. But here's what he says. Oh, that my words were written. Little did he know his words would be written in the history of Jesus. Oh, that my words would be written. Oh, that they would be inscribed in a book. The book which we read that sits on our dressers every day. That with an iron stylus and lead that they would be engraved in the rock forever. They're engraved in the rock forever. The Bible's the rock and listen to this, Job says, as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last, he will stand, take his stand on the earth forever. Jesus came. Who? There was only one Redeemer in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Only one redeemer, and it was Jesus. <laughs> Job would have no other way of knowing that there would be a redeemer come someday that would fix the sin and the unfairness of the world. He knew that by the divine inspiration of the Spirit of God went into him, and he writes this down, as for me, I know that my redeemer lives, and the cradle stable was not there yet. My Redeemer lives, he said, currently. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. That's a word we can say whenever we get a little bit afflicted. Do you ever feel like your faith is a little wishy-washy? Ah, I'm like, it's a little bit, Maybe not quite wishy-washy, but a little bit. It gets weaker when things go bad, stronger when things go well. I don't know. Maybe it works the opposite with some people. you got to admit, things went pretty bad for Job. He lost everything he had. 
most of his family, his wealth, his, his sheep. He lost his sheep. Yeah, he should have, though. <laughs> anyway, because she said, curse God and die. Job, come on, get this, stop this nonsense. But Job didn't even do that. And so she lived on, he lived on. But oh, disappointment. You see, we get disappointment. Jesus is in everything. And so Job did not falter. And the scripture says at the end of Job, in all this, listen to this, in all this it says Job did not sin nor turn his back on God. I know of people, you know of people who have turned their back on God because his, things have not worked out the way they thought God should work things out. Whether it be a sickness, whether it be some other thing that they thought God was going to do and he didn't do that. The problem with us, we think God is like us. We were a tiny bit like him, but only a tiny bit. God's not like us. God's not our model. The word likes to say, boy, if I was God, I would do this. If I was God, there wouldn't be any hunger, dying people of starvation. There wouldn't be any wars. First of all, you aren't God, and we don't even know the half of it. God has always given us a free will right from the day of the Garden of Eden. We've been given a free will. We can do what we want whenever we want, but we don't have to. We can make choices for God. Our choices depend our, our destiny depends on our choices. We can't say, I'm heaven bound and I'm living for the devil. We can't say, I'm heaven bound, but I'm, gonna, but I'm not living for Jesus. We're called to live for Jesus. We're called to follow him, to obey him, to give our lives to him, repent of our sin, and be a follower of him. That's what we're called to do. And then we're promised. The scripture says, He who is faithful unto death will receive the crown of life. It says it in Revelation, says it in James. He's called us to be faithful to the end. Kind of like marriage. I say this a lot of times, but it's a good illustration. What woman would marry a man if a man sat at the altar when he's doing his promises? before the people that are at the wedding, if he said, I promise to be faithful to my wife most of the time. <laughs> it's not going to cut it. The bride would expect the groom to be faithful to her all of the time. We are the bride of Christ. And we can expect faithfulness from our God all of the time. And we're called to be faithful to him. So, beloved, may we follow the course. May we not get discouraged when we feel the things are not going the way you want them to go. They hardly ever do. But look at the news, not often, not as often as I do, and see what's going on in other places. Why would you and I think that things aren't going very well for us? Even on our worst day, things are going really well. You know, I've never had anyone try to shoot me. I think that some people would like to have shot me, but I've never had to dodge any bullets. And there's places in the world where people are dodging bullets all the time. They're looking out for bombs. Jesus is your Savior. And he's my savior. May we follow him. And may we be faithful until death. Until death do his part as a marriage vow goes. Sunday mornings we gather around what we call the Lord's table. The bread and the cup which reminds us of what I'm talking about today. Reminds us of the reminds me of the manger. Jesus came for me. We can now see the face of God and he goes to the cross for me. 
and he raises from the dead three days later, and he's victorious over death. He's victorious over sin. He is the only one in the universe that can take away your sin. Do you ever feel like, I'm just not good enough to get to heaven? You're right. You are right. You are not good enough. I'm not good enough. Billy Graham wasn't good enough. No one's good enough, but Jesus was and is. And he is the one that paid the price. He gave the sacrifice for us. It's not a game we're playing. It's not a little pretend church thing. It's a life-changing thing. It's about putting our life before Jesus and say, I'm following you. Lord Jesus, come and forgive me of my sin and make me one of yours. And we can call him our Savior, our, our friend, our Father, and we are his children. So today we take the bread and the cup. If you believe that Jesus forgives your sin, partake. If you don't believe, you shouldn't take it. Take it if you believe. Let's ask that as it asks the blessing. came across a video of a uh, woman who was a former satanic priestess who um, uh, main goal was to was to place uh, spells and curses on people and as to why she was invited over to people's houses I'm not sure but she was over at someone's house and she came out of her room and she wanted to go into the child's room and she wanted to put a curse on this child she said when I opened the door I felt completely powerless and I felt like I couldn't get close to the child's bed. Like I couldn't move forward. And I, I had felt like I was just weak. And when she looked over at the child sleeping in the bed, she said, I, I saw it what looked like the it looked like the child was covered in blood. And it was like I couldn't touch the blood. Almost like I if I felt like if I touched the blood, I would just die. And she even had told her satanic priestess elders, and they, they, were, they were taken back. They were shocked because they felt like they were up against a power they had no control over. Well, she had left her old life, and this former satanic priestess had become a Christian. And she said, it is so important to pray for your kids and she realized that the, the blood that she was seeing on the child was the blood of Christ. When Jesus went to the cross, that was the perfect sacrifice, the perfect blood. Because the payment of sin is death, and with death comes the shedding of blood. And so Jesus' blood is saying, like, my blood for you, you are forgiven, and no demonic powers may even touch you may even touch you. So when we take communion today, let's remember that any one of us, when we proclaim the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are covered in that blood, and we are forgiven, and Satan can't lay a finger on us. Lord Jesus Christ, you went to the cross. You went through the ultimate humiliation and pain and suffering and torture. Your blood was more than sufficient. It was more, that's all we can say, it was more, more than anything. And it's forgiven us and it's, it's given us a Savior. You are our Savior. May right now, Lord, we proclaim both your death and your resurrection in Jesus' name. Amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for going willingly to the cross. We thank you for taking away our sins when we ask you. We know scripture says, though our sins be as scarlet, O Lord Jesus, you will make them as white as snow. Bless the week ahead of us. You prosper our souls. We ask for safety in all the places we go and all the things we do. And may we be the light of the world. May we share our joy. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Enjoy some coffee. If anyone wants prayer today, stay behind. Someone will pray for you up here. And if anyone is not sure they're following Jesus and they've they're, uh, got a hope place in heaven, make sure you talk to one of us, me, whoever, and talk about that. God bless you today. I love to everybody. Have a happy week.